Please welcome member of the Legislative Assembly for Built Us All, Vicki Huntington. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I have a rather soft voice. I'm the only person in the legislature that has a two-foot high, closing on three-foot high microphone because the, the others can't pick up my voice. And I think I'll stand here so that everybody can see. But before before I start, I I am just thrilled to be here. Um, uh, the cross-border coalition was an amazing exercise in citizen power. It is one of those exercises that was successful, so seldom they are these days. Certainly we've been engaged in a number of them in, in Delta South, or South Delta, and uh, over the years, and have become very frustrated. And I think the frustration, if I can pause for a political moment, the frustration is one of the reasons why I was fortunate enough to be elected. Um, it is, it's unusual to have an independent, especially in a riding like Delta, solidly conservative, certainly liberal provincially, um, but there was enough frustration and anger among the citizenry that they felt they wanted to step forward and take a, a different approach to politics and just see whether it could benefit the community at all. And I'm deeply grateful because it has given me an opportunity to speak to some of the issues that I believe are terribly important. Um, this, be before I start talking about this isthmus that we share here, uh, I just want to say it feels like old friends we here. There's so many people that through the cross-border coalition days uh, I do and met, and then there's Ron or Jim Ron back and. Um, Jennifer and I thank you and Arthur and Mark and so many and I'm missing others you never should name names but um, I also want to say I'm sorry to hear that Ken Cameron is uh, no longer going to be made on the board I'm not sure if if, uh, if you realize that Ken, Ken is um, a guru <laughs> in, in the planning world uh, internationally and led the um, award-winning, international award-winning um, regional strategic plan for the Greater Vancouver Regional District. It was a document that was um, uh, heralded across North America and elsewhere. And you deserve tremendous applause for that because it has stood the test of time. And even though there's struggles along all the borders of it, uh, it's still the core of, of what Vancouver is trying to achieve as, as a region. Yeah. Uh, I was asked if, if uh, well, when Mark and, and Arthur asked if I would come down and speak with you, firstly, I was surprised. It's, it's a delightful invitation. Secondly, I'm a little embarrassed with Kaylee here because I did not even think of telling the congresswoman I was coming across the board and invading her territory. <laughs> because we think of ourselves as as neighbors in one. It's it's hard to if I was going elsewhere I probably would have done that. But um, at any rate, other than towers, we share another important, um, vastly important issue. And it's the great Pacific Migratory Bird Flyway. This um, community of ours. Well, let's switch. Let's switch. It help if I turn it on. Yeah. Good. I've given this presentation before, and obviously I haven't had time to take a satellite map of the entire area. But this whole region and right down through into the Skagit. This, if you look at an aerial uh, you know, satellite map, you'll see that all the way through here, it's basically a continuation of the Fraser River Delta. Mm -hmm. You've got the other smaller rivers, but they're basically like the Nicomechal in, in terms of their impact. It is the Fraser River that has created this huge um, agricultural delta in Washington and in British Columbia. This, for the purposes of, of my discussion, um, is, is what we refer to as the Fraser River Delta here. 
Uh, this is Boundary Bay, as you would know, Point Roberts, um, Tawasin Cove, I'm never sure what to call that. TFN, this, this water lot now belongs to TFN, Tawasin First Nation, for those of you who may not be aware. This was, once upon a time, all Roberts Bank. I think Roberts Bank could safely be called this now. So we've probably lost half of it. This is Sturgeon, well, Sturgeon Bank, no, Sturgeon Banks is up here. This is the Roberts Bank Wildlife Management Area. There's Weston Island, right? But just so you have a, a, an idea of, of what we're looking at and what I'm speaking to. The soils in this picture, um, and I'm sure that that would be the equivalent for down in Washington too, these agricultural soils are the finest soils in Canada. They have the highest classifications and they are absolutely the best you can get. And so when you hear people like me in South Delta and Jim we're talking about the agricultural lands, we're talking about agriculture on the finest soils in our country. The, the, I never know where to start here, but um, the estuary is an ecosystem of its own. It supports the migratory bird flyway. It is the primary stop for the migratory bird flyway on the west coast of North America. Without it, it's like driving from Vancouver to Calgary and finding that the gas station in Salmon Arm is, is closed. You, you just don't make it. So without the estuary, migratory bird flyway um, will will fail. It will cease to, to support the migration. Um, this migration, it's, it's an ecosystem. It's, it's an ecosystem, oops, sorry here. It's an ecosystem that feeds off eelgrass beds at low tide. Um, when the high tide comes in, the birds move on to the uplands and forage in the agricultural lands. The third component is um, fresh water, which they require for preening and without preening, they can't survive. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an ecosystem that supports millions of birds that are traveling through this estuary. Snow geese, there's upwards of 100,000 snow geese. This last year, it's close to 100,000. They winter on Wrangell Island in Russia. They summer and over summer, uh, no, sort of, they, they breed up in Wrangell Island in Russia. They winter in Delta on the Fraser Estuary. Swans, um, widgeon, mallards, hundreds of thousands of them. Um, winter in the north, or winter over in Delta, uh, and in the Skagit, the geese especially around February will move from uh, Delta down into the Skagit for two or three weeks, then they move back into Delta, and then they're headed for Russia. This, the, the swans are here, the widgeon, the mallards, in their tens of thousands. Canada, um, not Canada, but Delta, uh, is also, has the highest concentration of raptors in Canada. Mm -hmm. And that was, has had a lot of reasons why it's, um, a, a, much of it, is because in agriculture until the last few years depended upon um, fallow lands. So the lands had an opportunity to develop old fields and you need about two to three years of land in old field before you have a good crop of, of voles and mice that support the, the raptor population. Um, so the eagles, would <laughs> they've been attracted to the landfill and now to the uh, bio waste facility, but um, the raptors in a whole, as a whole were, it, it is uh, the, the biggest concentration of them in Canada, which is hard to believe and hard to understand. And what I have found in giving these types of talks is that so very few people understand what Delta is and the significance of this area to, to wildlife. I don't know why it's not made a critical component of, of the region. 
Um, we also have the snowy owls, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, they m migrate down most years. You can see them along um, the Boundary Bay beaches and mm -hmm. along uh, the beaches and marshes um, on uh, Brunswick Point. A magnificent thing to see, just mm -hmm. magnificent. And uh, it's hard to believe that they actually migrate to us, to here. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Dunlin and other shorebirds. Um, and the world's population of western sandpiper. Mm -hmm. The world's population of western sandpiper. And what's so significant about the delta for the sandpiper is that uh, Dr. Bob Elner in the Canadian Wildlife Service, which is situated on Westham Island, um, about uh, eight to ten years ago, I think, he and colleagues in Europe started examining what it was exactly that the sandpiper was eating. Everybody thought, oh, they're just eating little bits of people, you know, little things that are crawling around on the mudflats. But it turns out they are not eating little things crawling around on the mud flats. They're slurping up a biofilm that sits on the mud flat and is absolutely unique to this Fraser estuary. And it's, there's a bit of it found in Boundary Bay, but the primary um, element um, is, is on the mud flats in Roberts Bay. <coughs> so for a long time, it has been recognized that the Fraser River Delta, and again, I am including, I wish we had all of this area <coughs> down here, but I have little knowledge of what the American uh, interest in, in wildlife is uh, south of the border, and, and that's my ignorance. Uh, but for a long time, uh, it, this has been understood by, by scientists and people who are interested in, in the, the bird life that um, Delta was, and the Fraser Estuary was important, and it has been designated an important bird area. An important bird, an IBA is an actual designation for a sen an environmentally sensitive area. So all of this area, I think you could effectively say that that shouldn't be there anymore. <laughs> but this area is primarily designated an IBA, or an important bird area. It is, in fact, known as the Fraser River Delta important bird area. On top of being an IBA, it is also designated a Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve. Again, a recognition that it is critical habitat for shorebirds migrating throughout um, the Western um, North America. So th this is, you know, the area of the Shorebird Reserve. Whether it extends down into the States, again, I really am sorry, but I cannot tell you that. Perhaps somebody in, in the audience can. Here, just for your information, is uh, Canadian Wildlife Service is on Western, uh, Western Island. That's the Hunt, um, oh, what's happened here? Let's let me skip through here. Okay. Recently, like in the last few years, um, we finally obtained a designation as a Ramsar site. A Ramsar site is an international designation of an important, um, internationally significant wetlands. So this is really one of the highest levels of, of environmental designation for wildlife that you can get, for bird life that you can get. It's a collection of various things. It's the uh, You'll start going, this is the Sturgeon Bank, Wildlife Management Area, Provincial Designation and Recognition, the Burns Bog Conservancy Area, the Boundary Bay Wildlife Management Area, the Serpentine Wildlife Management Area, South Arm Marshes Wildlife Management Area, the Alaxan National Wildlife Refuge, which includes the Rifle Bird Sanctuary. But notice that there is nothing at Roberts Bank, and that's because the port, the port has refused to cooperate um, up until a few years ago when, um, after they had 
uh, negotiated a transfer of, of lands from the province to the port for the construction of Delta Port. The province then went ahead in the last five or six years and, uh, well, it's been since I, because um, I know I met with the minister and said, when are you doing this? Uh, so it's been within the last five or six years. So this, finally, the Roberts Bank Wildlife Management Area. But you'll notice it stops. <laughs> it stops um, around Delta Port. It stops around the BC Ferry Terminal. Um, it includes a little bit of the Tawasin the cove there. And it includes a little bit of water outside the Tawasin water lot the Tawasa First Nation water line. So this gap here um, used to be provincial land because the province owns the bottom of the Georgia Strait. So when that was finally decided in the courts, the port had a connection, of course. So a lot of talk went on to get these lands now transferred from the province to the feds, and, and that has been done. And then you'll see this nice little job here. So at least we have a Ramsar site that does now have um, a Roberts Bank Wildlife Management Area of sorts as part of it. Sorry, a Ramsar. Ramsar. The Ramsar, the Ramsar Definition, site. what is a Ramsar? It's a wetland of international significance. It's an international designation that is available to very few sites in the world. And, um, it's a UN agreement signed in Ramsar, Iran. Okay, so it, it's a UN, I, I didn't go into that, but yeah, it is a UN, United Nations Agreement among nations, and it's called Ramsar because it was signed in a town called Ramsar in Iran. So it's, um, Thank you. Now, this is not something skipped here. Just something, yeah. Something's was missed. Something's been missed. What is what? I, what I'm here for is um, basically to say this whole area is under threat, big, big threat right now, and we are at a crossroads. I believe as citizens, either we are going to try and protect and save what's left of the migratory bird flyaway, or we're going to watch it disappear and probably disappear fairly quickly. Is there a moral duty? I think there is, but it's one of the reasons I'm here to talk about it. So what, what I had hoped to do in the next two or three slides, and they seem to be all of a sudden missing, I'm not sure why, but um, was to show you a couple of areas of Delta that are being heavily impacted by various forms of development right now. This is the Boundary Bay Airport. Um, this when, when Delta, when it transferred from Transport Canada to Delta about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, this whole area was industrial. But under the agreement, it was to remain industrial for light aircraft purposes only. The municipality, the um, Corporation of Delta, has decided that they are industrializing that strip. And you will have noticed, perhaps, that there is now Heli Jet One, Heli One. There is a huge, a million square foot distribution um, uh, facility has just gone up. And there is another one being built, um, all of which started with a request from the farmers to build a small distribution center for BC Fresh. And some of us on the council said, well, that's like opening the doors, but we did anyway. And, Sure enough, the doors have been opened and that is now fully industrial. All the way, oops, all the way up here uh, along, um, I think that's 80th, uh, up here are greenhouses, mm -hmm. huge greenhouses. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, 50 acres, that I guess it's probably 150 acres worth of greenhouses right there, if not more. This is a, now a, a golf course, as you know. This was a raptor management area, which I think has been lost to corporate memory, both provincially, federally, and um, municipally. I think everybody's just forgotten this. This was so critical that it was a, became a designated raptor management area. <coughs> this is the bio waste facility. This is all turf farming. This is equestrian. 
So really what you have here, oh, and this is OWL. If any of you haven't been to OWL or know of OWL, that is a facility that is incredible. That is a facility that, that rescues and rehabilitates raptors, birds of prey. And it's huge, absolutely huge, and struggles for funding. So what we see here, a component of East Delta that was 20 years ago, 15 years ago, vital habitat, just incredibly valuable habitat for the birds. And it's basically gone. It, it's basically gone. So, I, I can't, I don't understand what's happening here. Okay. So, why is all of this happening in Delta? It's happening because um, about, I don't know, about 40 years ago, more, more, about 40 years ago, 45 years ago, the province and um, decided, and I think the federal government was part of it, Ken would probably know the history much better than I, although we're researching it like mad right now, um, decided the deep water off Roberts Bank made a perfect area for a deep water port. So they would build an island, and the first stage of the island would be the coal port. So they did, they built the coal port. Uh, along with that, they, uh, you, some of you may have heard about backup lands, maybe not. Anyway, they expropriated a lot of the agricultural land along the BC rail tracks because they were hoping to have industrial land that would eventually service the port. So then they, they built the, the uh, coal terminal, then they built the container terminal, then a few years ago they built the Delta Port, the third berth, what we call the third berth. Um, in spite of an environmental assessment, a Canadian federal environment panel assessment, a review panel, that said there should be no more construction in this area because of its vital sensitivity and environmental value. So they built this. Now that's not enough. Now what they are is they've made an application to the Canadian Environmental Assessment Office um, and we're in the third stage of that application now to build Terminal 2. And this is what we are all terribly concerned about. If you build Terminal 2, the pressure on the remaining land is going to be so significant that um, it's pretty obvious it'll start to crumble and, and be used industrially rather than for agricultural purposes. Moreover, it's, it's being built, proposed, um, right on the Roberts Bank. They already have an application into the province to um, reconstruct an eelgrass bed <coughs> here because they know that once they start dredging, all of this eelgrass will disappear. It's not going to be built on piers. It's going to be a solid rock foundation. So the entire tidal flow is going to be interrupted here. And I think what's personally in the back of their mind, and when you see the last slide, you'll probably agree with me, I think what's personally in their mind is that they'll, they'll build this, and this will just fill in naturally and they'll use it as reclaimed land in another 20 years. So that's what we're fighting, and that's what I'm asking a cross-border effort be made, because as I go on, I just, here's, here's what's happening um, as a result. All of the blue are, green, are greenhouses. This is the industrial area above Boundary Bay. This is the golf course. This is the new Tawasin Treaty lands, and that's Musqueam Reserve. Now Musqueam is, has just indicated they want to develop that. So we're apparently, I, it doesn't matter, anyway, they've indicated that. So you can, then when you start to look again at not just the coverage of the open soils with uh, uh, green, uh, greenhouses, when they were building the new uh, Delta, the new South Fraser Perimeter Road, no, excuse me, when they were building Tawasin Springs at the public hearing, 
the director of the Delta Farmland and Wildlife Trust at the time said, if you develop this piece of soil, which a lot of it was still just open agricultural land not being used and it had some parts of it had been filled, but it was habitat um, sitting beside the old golf course. If you look at develop that and include the habitat that's being the old field habitat that's being removed from the south, thirty percent of the old field habitat in Delta disappeared with those two developments. Mm -hmm. The South Fraser Perimeter Road and, and this. And when you think about the heron rookeries along here, how the herons, well, I don't think the herons are going to survive. I, I don't know where they're going to go because um, all of this land I used to see herons in here all the time, all through here. Um, the ditches have been filled, the, the habitat's gone, um, and, and all of this land is also going to be developed too right along the, the forest there. TFN is putting 4,000 homes on that land in addition to what I think will be the casino and the, um, the uh, mall. And all of this area here is industrial. <clears throat> Do they have a projection on how many trucks, more trucks are going to be on Highway 17 if they build the additional port? The additional port. I assume it's going to increase I, immensely. I, I don't know how much. They're more likely to barge it in, I, I think. You still have to, if it's container Other shipping, than along the causeway. If it's, if it's container shipping, they still have to get it out of there. What, the bridge well, well, the trains after the trains or traffic increase. Traffic increase. Oh, the traffic increase. On 17, yeah. Built we oh, already have enough. There's so many operational. trucks going on there right now. Uh, oh, yes. Um, well, it's doubling the size of the yeah. container facility. It's more than doubling the size of the container facility. So, so double the traffic. I know this is taking a bit of time, and I'll try and hurry here. All of this, whoops, all of this land is under option by Emerson and Siegel for, to develop a, a, um, a modal yard. Uh, and, I've told, and all of the red land is held by BC Hydro, whose new mandate, well not new mandate, whose mandate now is to purchase and hold port-related land, or not BC Hydro, BC Rail. Their mandate is to purchase and hold port-related land. So it's going. They look at this as an industrial triangle. That is what an intermodal yard is. That is where you transfer the containers from truck to rail to and back and forth. And, and they hope to build that with huge distribution centers. And they hope to build that right there, right by the Tawasin First Nation. This is the old plan. This is the original plan for Delta Port. This was the first phase, the coal port. So now we have here and now we're going to have up here. This is all reclaimed land. I don't think this is likely to happen because it's now TFN waterlocked, but um, that's what the original plan was and they're plodding along and nothing seems to be stopping them. So I guess that's what it looked like here 10 years ago. 10 years ago, that's looking out at Delta Port this, this land is now all TFM, um, and it's sad. It's sad, because what we're watching is, <coughs> we're witnessing the growth of a huge industrial um, port that is going to eat up the Fraser Estuary and the agricultural lands around it. And in doing so, it's going to collapse the Pacific Migratory Bird Highway, Flyway. So my, my discussion is always love it or lose it. That's not the last one here, but uh, anyway, love it or lose it. So I keep asking. I don't know how to stop it. No, that's okay. And I forgot to thank Bennett for being the brilliant <laughs> technical, technical guru he is. So, um, so I guess I have a few things to ask. Um, I know you're in a hurry, Mark, but I, I really have a few things to ask. Um, our American friends, and it's what I wanted to visit the Congresswoman about. Um, that 
report is affecting the deposition of sediment around Point Roberts. I don't know if you've seen a change in your beach on the west side, but it's because the hydrology of the area has changed. I don't know why the EPA and the Corps of, of um, Army Engineers hasn't been more interested in that fact. In the environmental assessment, the EPA uh, in Canada, the, the EPA wrote a letter um, or a comment, but had very, very few comments. It took my office telling the environmental assessment office that the environmental studies had not included the international impacts and that no hydro hydrological studies had been done on the impacts of that terminal two uh, on uh, Point Roberts. And they have now included that in the assessment. Number three, all the growth in container all the container growth at Delta Port is being shipped to the United States. So that port that is in direct competition with SeaTac in Los Angeles, that port is serving the United States. And for the life of me, I do not know why Congress or wherever did it, but I understood it was the Senator of Congress, um, <coughs> defeated or didn't permit the uh, dollar a container surcharge because that was something that I think SeaTac, I'm not sure about LA, were hoping for, some of the commercial operators in the United States and Washington were hoping for, a surcharge on the con US bound containers coming from Canada into the States via Delta Port. Why they didn't, why they got rid of that idea, why they didn't um, pursue it, I don't know, because what they're talking about is, is, and I feel, and I know I'm being a, I hate to use the word traitor, but I'd be, you know, lynched for saying this, but this is, this is a competition with the United States of America. I don't understand why an international migratory bird treaty isn't being looked at by the State Department. I don't understand why the Commerce Department isn't looking at container surcharges to protect their own industrial um, operations in Seattle and Los Angeles. I don't understand why the public in both sides of the border aren't outraged that we are looking at the demise of an entire migratory bird flyway. Without that estuary, it collapses. And I guess I've just reached in my old age the point where I look at I look at life, I look at food, agricultural land, and I look at, at whether or not um, we support them and save them, or whether we walk away from them in the name of, of the economy. And I guess I've come to the conclusion that my priority is life and um, environment, and that we seem to have a balance right now, but if we grow, it's over, in my estimation. But again, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm pleased to be able to talk about my pet concern here, and uh, I hope that I've raised some interest, raised some interest in some of you to actively think about what we are in this isthmus to the wildlife of this world. Thank you. Let's open it up to uh, questions, discussion. Brian. Um, one thing that you that you alluded to, which I'm not sure that either government is paying attention to, is not only the impact on the birds and our agricultural sustainability, but um, these solid bed ports are really changing the hydropont, you know, the hydro flow. And there's already this huge silt ledge building out there, which, at the slightest, you know, tremor, could collapse and provide an interior tsunami to the Salish Sea. Um, the reports I've read, we could lose Lighthouse Park; it would be underwater on the American side, and um, Galliano Island 
you know, and Salt Spring would be, you know, almost completely flooded and wiped out. The, <clears throat> that's a human cost. You know, well, that's a human to cost. The agricultural and the wildlife cost. Yeah. Um, I, they have had, they will say they've had, and if you look at the, the reports, the reports for the environmental assessment are 10 volumes, 10 volumes stretches from here to here, um, incredibly intricate and uh, scientific with conclusions like, other than during construction, there will be no light impact, no additional light impact. You're doubling the size of the port. You're doubling the horizon of the port. You're doubling the length, <laughs> but there's not going to be any further light impacts. Um, the, there will be no further. You know how it hazes over in the cloud. How it goes orange here in, in cloud cover. That won't be. That won't be added to. Um, they say there is no hydrological impact, but I don't understand that, and I don't know why. The Army Corps of Engineers hasn't been called in yeah. to do that independent study on that they issue. They just need to read the geology journals. Well, yeah. yeah. So I, I can't speak to a lot of the science. I only know that I have read a huge amount. And um, I'm, I'm doubtful of some of its conclusions, which for a layman I ought probably ought, and a politician I probably ought not to be saying. But I'm cautious. I, I'm very worried. Um, I can perhaps explain to you why conclusions like that come about. Yeah, please do. It's because the former government in Canada basically gutted all the scientists out of the Canadian scientific government in, uh, agencies. It's not much better on this side. It may even be worse. It's pretty widely acknowledged that we are no longer a representative democracy. We are an oligarchy, and the oligarchs don't care about any of that stuff. No, they, they don't really, and um, they say they do, and, and individually they do, but the, it's always Vicky. You've got to learn how to balance yeah. the economy and the environment. <laughs> and I remember talking to Les Little. Do you remember Ken Les Little, who was a VP of, of the Port of Vancouver at the time? And I just looked to him and I said, Les, if you think about the Greater Vancouver Regional District, think about the, the Lower Fraser Valley. Delta is all that's left. It's all that's left. Delta is the balance. So yes, forgive me if I say I'm being a little unrealistic from your point of view, but it's all that's left. Without it, it all collapses. And um, the, the, Canadian, the Environment Canada is freed up a little now. Even though the laws have been changed, which enable so much of what's happening out here to go on, um, they now feel that they can tell their truth to the review panel. So we'll see whether the review panel listens. Um, the province is. But the review panel. I mean, it's it's like our like our experience with the FCC. The FCC doesn't care, pretty much, for what the people say. Well, I think we have to wait. Uh, the, the, hopefully, the review panel will be honest and, and will look at the material and has enough of a secretariat behind them that they can analyze this vast amount of material I don't know. Hey, Arthur. Yeah, I'm glad Kaylee's here and, and I really do hope that um, that Del Betty's office will get involved with this and look at this because the impact on Point Roberts is significant. I think it um, is. One of the things that has puzzled me and maybe some, you know, geologist or engineer can explain it, but the causeway that leads out to Delta Port is solid. When any, seems to me, any coherent designer would make it a series of arches so that the natural tidal flows weren't disrupted. Well, you wouldn't want a series of arches because you've got the train. I mean, they can be it, made it's, very it's, stable. It, that, Delta Port is a very exciting place. I mean, it's massive industry. Yes, we, we, we took a day to go out advanced. and visit and see it. It's exciting. I love big industry. 
But when you're driving trains out there, you're not going to have little arches going over, you know, but they could have put big caissons under. And yeah, one of the problems that is leading to that, that buildup of what could be this slump is the design of the causeway. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that it's changed the tidal flows in Point Roberts. Yeah. And our shoreline is changing. But they say it hasn't. Uh -huh. So somebody, <laughs> somebody has to find out where the truth is. That's what I'm looking for. Glad that Ken is here. In the coal port. But I know it's getting late. And the, 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 I want to interject. Just very quickly, the distribution of uh, current flows in the air, we get the soot from the coal port. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah. Hold us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Sorry. Dorothy, did you bring your. Uh, your sample of whatever it is that you wipe off of your... I cleaned it off the deck yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> when, it's um, it's terrible. Just a political insight and for um, Kaylee's benefit. Uh, as I mentioned before, Freeman Beach, which is on the west side, which really gets the brunt of what we believe is coal dust pollution, uh, is active in this organization and they, they make their voices heard. And we've tried to... to look into the issue of coal dust and we've contacted Westport and we've contacted uh, our congressional representatives and uh, um, Did West Shore not do West, a sampling for West you? Shore, you know, I don't know what the result, they they did, I will give them credit, they did bring a, uh, what do they call it, a mam mamu, mamu the, and they parked it out there for six months and they parked it over here for six months. Do we know what the results are? That's what I was asking do, you. Do they, do they still claim that it's diesel uh, particulate from the... Uh, Mark, I don't know. I understand it's more from the ferries. That's what they say, yeah. yeah. Well, well, when you look out the window... The ships. No, no, ships. No. Yeah, ships. when you look out the window from a house on the west side and you see this cloud mm -hmm. over over uh, the, the coal pile... It's, it's worse hard. when they don't turn on the misters over. Yeah, and, and um, you know, uh, our friend, so late Nick week. Piles, I guess it was Nick, or was it, no, who was it, who was it from Freeman Beach? You used to, no, it was Frank, Ad, Ad, oh, Frank. Addison, he, Addison, he had, Frank. Addison, he had a, a telescope in his living room. He used to look out there at this uh, coal dust whirling around in the wind, and he'd call up Wishore and say, turn on your sprinklers, and they're, they're on. They're not on, I'm looking at it through the telescope. <laughs> so, but when we, um, we tried to um, get, enlist, uh, um, who's our who's a congressman? Uh, who's our previous congressman? Larson. 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 Larson, who's still in Congress, but the the districts are redrawn, so he's, he's not our con so not our congressman. <laughs> you know, I talk quite the a bit with his. popular man at the caucus. Yeah, <laughs> I talked uh, quite a bit with his staff, and they I think they did a little research on it. I said, how is it possible? That there's, in our opinion, at least, cross border pollution. Is aren't there treaties? Aren't there, uh, you know? Uh, rules against that. You can't just sort of let your stuff go across the border. And they said, the answer I got was, yes, there are agreements, there are treaties, but they don't have enforcement mechanisms. And secondly, this is the more important thing, I think, they, he said to me, frankly, the uh, State Department isn't much interested in little little uh, nuisance claims like that from Point Roberts because there are more Canadian grievances against American pollution and they don't want to open up that can of worms. <laughs> so we're in a, we, politically that. we're in a weak position but here I, in Point Roberts. Yeah, and I, I, it's always finding that little wedge that you can sneak into because the political realities are, are there. And yes, the International Migratory Bird Treaty has, it doesn't even have, it has habitat provisions. You're supposed to protect habitat. Um, and that's what I think is, is starting to fail here. Uh, and that's why I wish there was some interest in the Americans to start triggering an examination of that. Um, but there are no enforcement rules. It's just a treaty that has to be respected by both sides. Then there's um, uh, somebody needs to have an independent uh, engineering review of the hydrology of this area. Because the people who do the study for the environmental assessment is the port. So I, I'm not calling like into question the engineering expertise and, and professionalism of the people that would have done the study. But 
it's a self-interested study, and they know where their bread and butter is, and um, it needs to have an independent review. Mm -hmm. Is there an impact on Tawasan Beach, on Freeman Beach, on the isthmus itself? We know the salmon migration pattern has changed because of the causeways. We know that eelgrass beds have changed because of the way that they replanted them. We know so many things, but in Canada, the law was changed that you can't look at the cumulative impact assessment. So they look at this part, and then, oh, we want to build this, so you look at that part. And there's, there's very little ability to force a review of the whole, and that's what's so frustrating. So you have to hope to find protections here and there, and can we trigger this and can we trigger that? Can we trigger an American interest somehow that will join us in an attempt to protect the estuary? So, yes. Vicki, uh, we're Albertans that just come here to holiday sail. Aren't you lucky? And, yeah, and, <laughs> and enjoy I you wish folks I lived here and too. enjoy <laughs> the, this area. That's wonderful. We live in a province that's been shipping coal here for 50 years. There's more coal to ship. British and you're now telling me they're competing with the US. Is it SeaTac or something you mentioned? Well, no, the coal shipments are coming from the America, from Wyoming, Wyoming. into West Shore. All of the coal? No, not all. No, no Alberta. But okay. mostly it's BC and, and Wyoming that's coming in. And so um, going to China. It's coming up. Yeah. The, the, that's, we're shipping it to China. But the point is, it, now is it shipping to China then? Mostly. Okay. It's it just being stuff. stored there. Okay. So this is and, just a trans. And there's a big a large, program. By the way, it's the largest coal terminal in North America. I'm not surprised. Yeah. So. <laughs> but yet we, I mean, we travel through some of those coal communities just to get out here, and they're big industries. Oh, I know they're big industries. And some of them are. Some of them are getting tightened down, they've been bought out and all those other other things, but the net of it is that the the part of this whole, even our government, uh, one of the big arguments they had is our economy is a mess because we can't get our bitumen created and shipped out to help the economy of and Alberta, and but at the same time we even use coal in Alberta know, yeah. for energy and fuel and, and other good things. So, site C. Yeah. So, um, uh, that isn't that the whole debate? Is it the economy, and do we allow, and do we need every bit of the economy that that people want to generate, um, or should we be picking and choosing to find a balance? That's the great debate. Problem is, we're not having that debate um, in in most of our most no. of our forms. And again, you, know, you right mentioned these the 4,000 homes, more. these 4,000 homes that are going to be built, mm -hmm. and this mall that's going to be built, and the casinos and all those. Mm -hmm. I think it's distracted greatly from the whole idea the fields, of shipping some raw materials for the fuel industry. Well, it's, I know that we're, we're up against um, forces that are very real and very large and have all the money and all the influence. And and it's like starting on the tower battle. Only we've, there's some of us have been on this battle for a long time. Starting with, why don't we see if we could get some attention paid to the va ecological value of Boundary Bay? So the Boundary Bay Conservation Committee works hard, does all the science, gets, a, gets the Boundary Bay Management Area designated. Then, all of that was done through volunteers working. The Roberts Bank Management Area, the Sturgeon Bank Wildlife Management Area, the Burns Bog Conservation Lands. All of it's done by people who care about the land. And I, I am so torn with the realities of, of industrialization and economy. It's just, I've come to the conclusion personally that a balance is needed, and in my hometown, we are the balance. And if you want to do anything else, you got to find a better place to do it because you are destroying something that is a world resource. 
and a world value. Some, there are values, as far as I'm concerned, there are values that go beyond the economic. And, uh, and if we don't fight for those values now, they will be gone. And those gone. values we have, I, my listening to, seeing the pictures of the birds that are here was shocking to me. That See, we've nobody got knows that right much, here. And it's not in the hundreds or five hundred. Fifteen minutes it's, drive away, it's hundreds you could of be thousands. in the middle of those hundred thousand snow geese. If you've ever gone and looked at a field of snow geese, it's a wonder of the world. And take your earmuffs too. <laughs> it's a wonder of the world to see white as far as you can see. And if you're lucky enough to be there when they're coming in from the eelgrass beds and the chevrons are coming in, one after another, just it's a wonder of the world. And we're going to lose it. Wow. Yes, sir. In your opinion, does the Ramsar Convention and other similar things, do, do they have any practical value at all? The practical value is um, creating an awareness that there is a designation of environmental sensitivity and importance. Um, and it does center the attention of scientists and people within the natural world. But it's not catching the imagination or interest of government because it's in the way. And how we make them understand, or at least I, I don't mean to, because it's very hard for, for somebody like me who comes from a business family, entrepreneurial family, to say, uh, you know, maybe we better hold the line. Maybe there's an, a value that goes beyond the dollar. It's hard because um, the economy and, and is, is the driving force. It's what feeds us. And so, but this is all that's left. This is all that's left, and we're going to lose it because government won't listen. And so how do we make them listen? The people make them listen. There have been people in, in, in Delta. It's an organization called Against Port Expansion. And what's the other one? Citizens Against Port Expansion. And they work together. But it's not enough. It, it, needs, it needs more. It needs the United States of America. I hate to say it, but it needs the United States of America. There's also voices of freezer. freezer. <laughs> Phrase your voices, yeah. But what's happened is that we've never been able to capture um, the imagination and the will of the greater public. And that's the difficulty. So that's why I'm here talking. And I thank you for asking me to come and thank you for listening. Thank you.